Hello everyone and welcome to the final chapter of Shmuel Aleph. And uh, I want to say that that's a real accomplishment for all of us to have uh, finished Shmuel Aleph. It's a very long uh, book, 31 chapters, and uh, we're coming to the end of it. And I think we're actually going to leave uh, the best to last. This chapter, we are going to talk about suicide, assisted, su assisted suicide, martyrdom, and see a couple of sources and hopefully open up for discussion. That's one of the keys I want to try and do. I know it's hard on Zoom to have conversations, but I'd like if you're able, when the time comes, to unmute and let's discuss some of these uh, very important uh, commentaries. So. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to get in there. And uh, at the beginning of the chapter, it says as follows. Ufelishtim nilchamim Israel. What a great opening lines. And the Pelishtim fought with Israel. What are we doing here? The uh, Navi or the, the, uh, the, the narrator here is basically returning us back to where we were before, which was chapter 30 and chapter 29, they were dealing with David's story and how David didn't end up having to fight in this battle. If we go back to chapter 28, it was right before the war. It was right before the battle. So it's just telling us we're back to that stage. And the men of Israel fled from before the Philistine, and the slain fell on the Mount, on Mount Gilboa. And uh, the Ma'am Loez notes something here, the fact that they fled and then they died. And he writes, the men of Israel died, why? Because they fled. Defeat sets in when soldiers start to flee. And it's an interesting thing, which is, uh, we all know this, the importance of uh, military order and following the chain of command because once chaos exudes on the battlefield that's when uh, it can really uh, fall apart. It's really interesting when you look at all the battles which are described in Navi, especially in Yehoshua, Shafetim, and Shemuel, they're all dealing with uh, one army in total chaos and disarray and they're often picked off. And it's on this time where, where we are in disarray, where we are, uh, you know, sadly, that's what caused the situation. Uh, again, lacking in belief led to that. And then if we didn't believe in ourselves, we ran away from the numbers, and then we died. Then it says here, Vayad Beku Philistim et Shaul vet Banan, Vayaku Philistim et Yonatan, Vet Abinadam, Vet Makishua, Bene Shaul. And the Pelishtim, this word Dabku, Vayat Beku, nearly comes from the word Devek, like glue, like they were glued to, the Pelishtim were glued to Shaul, like they were chasing him. Or they, here the translation I've given you here is overtook. But it's really Vayat Beku, it's, like it's, like, it's almost like this one, the word Devek, like they're, they're glued to, the, uh, to Shaul, like they were like laser targeting him and his sons, and the Pelishtim, they struck and they killed his three of his sons, Yehonatan, Avinadav, and Malkishua. And who's not there? Ishbosheth is not there. We're going to see him in uh, Shmuel Bet, and there's a different commentaries explain why he's not there, but uh, we won't go into that now, but know that there's another son of Shaul, which we'll uh, mention later. But uh, it's very important to note that the three main children of Shaul are killed, and they die before Shaul does. Then in Pasuk Gimon it says, And the battle fell heavy upon Shaul, and the archers found him, and he was very much frightened of the archers. And this whole phrase here, he was scared or frightened of the archers. What does that mean that he was frightened of the archers? And this is what's known, and to understand is, he knew at that moment, and this is very critical for our discussion that we're going to have, he knew at that moment there was no escape. He knew he was going to certain death. Not only that, 
he knew from bringing up Shemuel from the dead that he would die in this battle. But once he saw that the archers were around, he knew not only that he was going to die, but they were going to kill him. And so this is where our discussion is going to take us. As the Psukim say, Vayomer Shaul lenosechelav, Shlof charbecha, Vedakreni ba, Peniavo haarelim haele, Utkaruni, Vehit alalu bi, Velo ava nosechelav, Kiare meod, Vaikach Shaul, et hacherem, Vaipol aleha. And Shaul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and run me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and run me through and mock me. But his armor bearer was unwilling, for he was very much afraid. And Shaul took the sword and fell upon it. That's okay. Vayar no sechelav ki met Shaul. Vayipol gamhu al charbo, vayamot ima. And the armor bearer saw that Shaul had died, and he also fell upon his sword and died with him. And then one more pasuk. Vayamot Shaul ushloshet bana veno sechelav, gam kol anashav vayamahu yachdav. And Shaul and his three sons and his armor bearer died. Also, all his men died together on that day. And we have this feeling here of a finality, a great sadness of the death of Shaul, his three sons, his armor bearer. And it's an interesting point here. The armor bearer commits suicide, but he won't kill the king of Israel because he is fearful. What is he afraid of? He's not afraid of, he doesn't want to kill the king, but he's willing to take his own life. What is that telling us? He won't help someone die, but he won't, but he will kill himself. And the commentaries explain that he wasn't willing to kill the anointed of Israel. Shaul was anointed God, king of Israel by Shemuel. So it's God is anointed, and therefore he was fearful. But I want to get into two discussions. The first one is a technical one which is, who killed Shaul? And the next question is a much deeper discussion, which is discussing, really getting into the, the, the meat and potatoes of the, of the discussion of suicide, assisted suicide, and uh, martyrdom. But first of all, we need to know some psukim in the first chapter of Shemuel Bet. Don't, you don't uh, rest on your laurels. You have to go straight into the next chapter. And the psukim begin as follows. I've, I've taken out the first five, but uh, I want to get to you to Pasuk Vav. It says as follows. Vayoma hanar hamagidlo nikro nikreti baha gilboa vinei shaul nishan al chanito and the youth who told him said, I chanced to be on Mount Gilboa, and behold, Shaul was leaning on his spear, and behold, the chariots and the leaders of the cavalry had overtaken him. And he turned around behind me, behind him, and he saw me. And he called to me and I said, here I am. Vayom eli miata, vayomar elav amaleki anochi. And he said to me, who are you? And I said to him, I am an Amalekite. Vayom eli amadna alai umototeni, ki achazani hashavat ki chol od nafshi bi. And he said to me, stand over me now and put me to death. For a great shudder has seized me, for as long as my life is within me. And I stood over him, 
and put him to death. For I knew that he would not live after his fall. And I took the crown which was on his head and the armlet which was on his arm, and I brought them here to my Lord. And therefore the obvious question comes up, which is, who killed Shaul? It wasn't the armor bearer, because he was afraid. But didn't we read that Shaul fell on his sword? So what does it mean here that this Amalekite is saying, I killed Shaul? So we have to do some detective work. There's another question which you have to also, yeah, another discrepancy there. You saw that the Amalekite said, who was it that Shaul was afraid of in Shemuel Aleph? The guys with the arrows. But uh, who does he say in Shemuel Bet? It's the chariots. It's the cavalry. It's the horsemen that uh, Shaul was worried about. You see that in Pasuk Vav? I was there. And the chariots and the leaders of the cavalry had overtaken him. But way back when, what did Shaul, what's it say in Gimel? The archers had found him. It's interesting to note that. So the Radak, Rav David Kimchi says, Shaul was close to death. His soul was departing, but he didn't die until the Amalekite killed him. But it's also possible that what? The Amalekite didn't kill him at all. He was just the first person to find Shaul dead. He only told David to get a reward. Okay? And that's an interesting perspective because he's thinking he's going to be rewarded for this. And we'll talk much more about this uh, next week in the world of, as Elliot puts it there, in the world of fake news. Absolutely. But it's interesting there. Uh, I just, I was about to... Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, no, maybe bring, bring it back up. It's going to remind me what I was going to say. Yeah, that uh, isn't it relevant that who's the one who is going to kill Shaul? An Amalekite. Why isn't Amalekite going to kill Shaul? Because Shaul didn't kill them. And so, therefore, what are we learning from here? Not only, what is the main thing which Shaul lost his kingdom for, because he didn't show, he, he, he wouldn't show ruthlessness. He, would, he, he wanted to show mercy to the Amalekites. And what was the other sin that he did? Showing no mercy, where he should have been merciful, to the city of Nov, the city of the Kohanim. So isn't it appropriate that who should want to kill him? Who's going to remove that terror, that seizure, that feeling of, uh, of, of non-bikam is to be killed by an Amalekite. To show you, you showed them mercy, you're going to be killed by them. And again, we will talk more about this next week when we learn Shemuel Bet. What I'd like to do now is really jump in to this discussion about uh, who is killing... Uh, the, it seems to me, again, I don't want to discount the Radak's comment that it, it, it's an easy thing to say that what happened, Shaul killed himself, but he was not dead yet, and the Amalekite finished him off. That's very much a possibility. But I want to get into this whole thing of Shaul wanting his armor bearer to kill him, or he himself killing himself. And how is that permissible? Uh, the Raul Bag says, as Gersonides, Shaul preferred to be killed by his friend than to be killed by his enemies. So when you know you're going to die anyway, better to be killed by a friend than an enemy. The Radak makes a, a slightly different point. He says, Shaul knew he was going to die anyway. Therefore, it's not considered that he took his own life. He knew he couldn't escape from the Philistine archers. It was better that he kill himself than be tortured and mocked by them. Okay, what I'd like to do now is just open it up and discuss that point. If you know that you have no hope, that you're going to die in a matter of minutes or moments or hours, and it's going to save you from certain torture and mockery. 
are we allowed from what we just read there is this something to learn from or is this unique to Shaul Elliot well isn't isn't there is there an issue here of um, dying um, uh, for Kiddo Shashem like here like he's the he's the king and I mean I don't know I, I don't know if there's a I don't know if there's such a such a, a precedent but you know um, either there's Kiddush Hashem or that he knows that they're going to make a mockery of him and maybe it's better that um, not to make a mockery of the king and so which wouldn't be Kiddush Hashem. Right, so, so he's, he's certainly worried about what's going to happen to himself and let's say he's taken prisoner how they're going to torture him Maybe it's going to, it's certainly not going to be a prisoner switch, uh, switch, but is there, is this something that we're learning that beyond this, that this is permitted? Uh, Rubisi, you were, you were saying Masada. So I think it's interesting. I think we're going to come and have a look at that and discuss that other scenarios going on. I have brought for you a few. If you have a look here, I wanted to start first in Tanakh, and it actually happens that there are two people in Tanakh, in both in, in, in uh, Sefer Shofetim, in the book of Judges, where uh, people, well, let's have a look at them. We have Avimelech. Avimelech, if you remember, was a very bad hat. He was the son of Gidon, who killed all of his brothers in order to become the leader. And remember, it was uh, Gidon who said, you shouldn't have, uh, don't establish me as the king, do not have my children rule. But nevertheless, this is what happened. And uh, at the end of ch chapter nine, he gets his comeuppance and he's killed by a woman or he's mortally wounded by a woman. It says it here, Pasuk uh, Nun Gimel, Batashlech Isha Achat and a certain woman threw an upper millstone upon Avimelech's head and crushed his skull. And he called quickly to his armor bearer. And he said to him, Draw your sword and kill me. Lest they say about me, Isha harak tuhu, that a woman killed him, vayid karehu na'aro, vayamot, and his young man thrust him through and he died. Okay, and again, if you look there, the same phrases, shlop har becha, draw your sword, vayid karehu, and run him through. Those are the same phrases which were used in our chapter. And then more, more famously, in chapter 17, sorry, chapter 16, we have the story of uh, Shimshon, where uh, he asks Hashem one more time to give back his strength so that he can kill all the Pelishtim in the hall, including himself. As it says here, Vayikra Shimshon el Adonai, Vayoma Adonai Elohim, and Shimshon called to God and said, O oh Lord God, remember me and strengthen me now. Only this once, O God, that I may be avenged and the vengeance for one of my two eyes from the Pelishtim. And Shimshon grasped the two pillars of the center upon which the house rested and leaned upon them, the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And we all know what happens there. He brings the house down and all of the Pelishtim are killed and so is he. And that's considered as Eliot was pointing out, a Kiddush Hashem, a sanctifying of God's name. Whereas Avi Melech, that very bad hat, what is he trying to do? He's just trying to save himself from a reputation of being killed by a woman. 
or an old woman at that, but uh, it's all written in posterity that an old woman killed him. So I think he got his comeuppance pretty much. But here, do we learn from Shimshon that uh, it's permitted that when you know you're going to die and you're going to be tortured, both by Pelishtim here, then Shemuel and Shimshon Sorry, not Shimon. Sorry, Shaul and Shimshon. There's too many shins there. Uh, Shaul and Shimshon are behaving al kiddush Hashem. It's not something that we can learn from modern times, but certainly their actions were right. Were in, in fact even meritorious. I want to tell you another story from the Talmud, which gives a slightly different perspective. And it's a story from, uh, have you heard, everyone has heard of the 10 martyrs. The Sephardic tradition is to read it on Tisha B'Av and the Ashkenazic tradition is to read it on Yom Kippur. And one of those 10 martyrs is uh, Rabbi Hanina ben Tradion. And uh, here we're gonna listen to how he was killed. They brought Rabbi Hanina ben Tradion to be sentenced. And they wrapped him in the Torah scroll and encircled him with bundles of branches and they set fire to it. And they brought tufts of wool and soaked them in water and placed them on his heart so that his soul should not leave his body quickly, but he would die slowly and painfully. His students said to him, our teacher, what do you see? And Rabbi Hanina ben Terajan said to them, I see the parchment burning but its letters are flying to the heavens. They said to him, you too should open your mouth and the fire will enter you and you will die quickly. Or as I can understand it, let your body stay here and let your soul fly up to heaven. And Rabbi Hanina ben Terajan said to them, it is preferable that he who gave me my soul should take it away and one should not harm oneself to speed his death. If I pause the story here, what's it telling me? It's not my life to take. And even if I'm going to be tortured, I shouldn't try and hasten my death no matter what. But let's see how the story continues. The executioner said to him, my teacher, if I increase the flame and take off the tufts of wool from your heart so that you will die sooner and suffer less, will you bring me to the life of the world to come? Rabbi Hanina ben Terajan said to the executioner, yes. The executioner said, take an oath for me that what you say is true. Rabbi Hanina ben Terajan took an oath and the executioner immediately increased the flame and took off the tufts of wool from his heart causing his soul to leave and his body quickly. The executioner too leaped and fell into the fire and died. A divine voice emerged and said, Rabbi Hanina ben Terajan and the executioner are destined to the world to come. And you read the story and you think to yourself, wow, what have I just learned here? Other than the Romans are terrible and cruel and barbaric. Uh, number one, suicide is not permissible here. I can't even aid or speed up my death. However, someone can do it for me. But what's even more incredulous is that the executioner killed himself and he makes it to Olam Haba, he makes it to the world to come and he's not Jewish. It's interesting, there's a footnote on the Gemara, which I didn't tell you, where uh, Rabbi Yehuda HaNasi laments that the executioner gets Olam Haba. He says, I've been spending my whole life trying to get Olam Haba, and this guy gets it in a moment. It's a, a footnote which comes up every time we have these stories of people who, who uh, get Olam Haba, get a, a portion of the world to come doing a single act versus people who get the world to come for living righteous lives their whole lives. But uh, regardless, it seems, that, and this is a dialectics of Talmud, which I love, which is telling you two opposites which are true. For Rabbi Hanina ben Terajan, 
he could not imagine doing anything to speed up his own demise himself. On the other hand, he's totally fine with someone doing it for him. And I think he knew that uh, he wasn't just asking the executioner to help him end his life. He also knew that the executioner would face punishment. And so therefore he was allowing the executioner to kill himself. In fact, it's almost as if he is helping the executioner end his life so that he can join him in Olam Haba. But I just think it's just a, it's fascinating. You should always understand that in Talmud, that even in Agadah, even in the story parts of Talmud, you can see how both ends or both points of view are being taught and trying to understand those uh, sections. There's another piece of Talmud, which I haven't brought to you in Gitin, which talks about 400 young boys and girls who were being taken in captivity to Rome where they were going to be mistreated. The girls were going to be raped and the, and the boys were going to become slaves and possibly used for uh, also to be uh, mistreated. And the discussion point is that they decide to themselves, what should we do? We know what our fate is going to be. We're going to have a life where we're going to be, that, that's the life for us. And what do they all do? They all commit suicide. They all throw themselves into the sea and die. And that is, again, one of the sources in Jewish lore that Jewish martyrdom, dying al Kiddush Hashem, is considered al Kiddush Hashem. It's that that uh, one can take one's life if one knows that one is going to be tortured in such a way. And that's where the Rubisa came up with Masada. And you can think of the York massacre in, uh, in England in, uh, I want to say 1190. I'm, I'm thinking 1190, they were expelled in 1290s. So I'm thinking 1190. Uh, and many, many other stories where Jewish communities, especially in the Ashkenazic world, over the, uh, over the centuries, where where, where Jewish men and women have chosen martyrdom, have chosen suicide, where it's not considered suicide, where they have felt, where they have known certain death, certain torture, certain terrible things going to happen to them, where it's not considered suicide, it's considered martyrdom. And so therefore, when we read Shaul, killing himself or asking his armor bearer to kill him or the Amalekite killing him. It's not suicide. It is considered martyrdom and is considered Kiddush Hashem. Now, now that we've seen the sources and I've shared what I've wanted to share, would you like to uh, unmute and share a couple of comments on that? Agree, disagree, comments, questions, statements, anything? I remember the story of the 500 youth taking captive ending differently. Is there more that continues in the Gemara about it? Uh, that, that was my recollection. I didn't bring it in the sources, but that's, uh, I did look it up. That was how I saw it. It was too long. It was, uh, I just didn't have it. But that's what I saw. Uh, Rob, what were you going to add? Yeah, I, I don't think yet that, that you need to do any kind of justification or, or any kind of mental gymnastics to try to justify the, the suicides. I mean, the, the, the Tanakh doesn't really view them in a negative way. They're, they're, they just seem kind of a, a part of the narrative and we, they're understandable why they happened. And, and uh, in this case, Shaul gave a, a good reason why, why he wanted to be killed or, or, or why, why he killed himself. And that's it. And you know, there's, it's, I think, I think maybe it's our modern sensibilities that 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 we associate, you know, it's a, such a shame and and uh, and a negativity with with suicide. But it, when you when you read the texts in the in the examples that you gave, uh, and I I put some more into the chat also, you know, other suicides, uh, the, the the Tanakh doesn't really dwell on them as being as being such a such negative events, and that, 
I don't think they, they, they need to be justified with anything. I mean, Rob, if you have a look in uh, Bereshit chapter 9, uh, verse 5, it's very clear that our rabbis learn out from there that suicide is not allowed. I think the fact that this is not listed as one of Shaul's sins. If you go to the end of Ma'am Noez, I didn't bring it again, he lists all the virtues of Shaul and all his shortcomings. Uh, basically, a mitzvot averot uh, list uh, for Shaul. This is not listed as uh, an Avera. And I think it's not listed as an Avera specifically. Like this one has to be discussed and explained. Don't think that Shaul had a choice. Or don't think that Shaul made a bad choice. Shaul actually did the best possible thing, just as Shimshon did the best possible thing. Uh, as to your other examples, Rob, I mean, I normally I agree with you on a great deal, but uh, I'm just looking at the chat here. Uh, no, I think Achitofel and uh, Zimri killing themselves, that they are, uh, uh, I, I think there is an indictment on them that, uh, that, that Achitofel needed to kill himself. It's, it's not a good end and it's... Uh, and it's no, it's no good. I think uh, we have to explain this that in normal circumstances, it's not the case. Now, right. But the point I that I was to trying to make though was that was that the on. was that the text doesn't really dwell on it though, and it doesn't. Uh, it it just uh, mentions the circumstances and it says that it happens, and then that's it. And there's you know the, and anything else is just a uh, rabbinic commentary that. Happened centuries later, but the text right. itself. There's, there's no, there's really no say. Judeo ethics going on in the text, 100. percent Right. That was that was that was the only point that I was I was trying to make about. about it. There's 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 one other thing that 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 he does though. You know that people uh, people are concerned about what what happens to their 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 body after they die. It's it's a major consideration for people, and. Uh, and Saul must have known that that his his body was going to be uh, mutilated or or that he was going to be buried properly. Um, and when when this chapter repeats in the Book of Chronicles, there's it's a it's there's a well, it, it, it gets worse because his he, he gets a decapitated and the the head gets a thrown onto the wall. It's 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 really much worse. So he was uh, he was making arrangements to to uh, to try to avoid that from happening. And so since since the uh, since the arms bearer wouldn't wouldn't kill him, he had to kill himself, and that was that was the path towards ha towards avoiding ha having his body desecrated, which is which, which is a choice that that he was making. Uh, uh, either way, he had no choice. Excellent, Rob. Uh, that I can agree with. <laughs> and regarding uh, Jewish medical ethics and uh, suicide and assisted suicide today. And euthanasia, obviously, I'm giving you a, a, a few sources. There's a lot more to it, and it's a lot more complicated discussion. So I won't give a, a full rendition on that. Instead, we will continue in the Psukim and just uh, see what goes on here at the end of the chapter. And then I invite can you. A, can I just make another comment? Yeah, sure. Which, I mean, this, this whole kingdomship has been a disaster, right? So. Do you think uh, so, Elliot? Do you think? I don't think it's a disaster. I think uh, it's one of those things when you look back, is he one of the worst kings or is he a king who did accomplish a lot and was misguided? Uh, I mean, if you look at it from the narrative of uh, he was an adversary to, uh, to what's it called, to David, then yes. But uh, look at the way that David eulogizes him next week and we'll talk about that. Like he's not... I, I think it's a misunderstanding to think that he's a terrible king. I think uh, he was a very good king, but he had some character flaws, which, uh, in fact, some of his character flaws, like his great uh, modesty, uh, at the beginning became, it changed completely to him becoming extremely uh, defensive and arrogant of anyone trying to take his position. And yet he was constantly uh, belittled at the beginning for being too modest and told, you've got to stop being so modest. When are you going to start becoming, you know, becoming the king you're meant to be? So 
it's an interesting understanding of Shaul. I think uh, he's much maligned, but I don't think he's as bad as we think he is. I mean, for someone to show mercy to the Amalekites, I mean, with, a, with, a, with a, the hindsight that we have, it obviously we think it was a very bad call. And how could he destroy the city of Nov? You know, he was very angry and he made a terrible call. But other than that, he had a personal vendetta against David. Other than that, his two, the two things which are really part of his life are uh, the not killing the Amalekites and ordering the massacre of Nov. You know, so, there was one time where he did, where, where he offered up a korban instead of waiting for Shemuel, which we also talk about. But that's it. It's not like he, he did lots of things. Uh, he was still Yirat Shamayim. He still, you know, got rid of necromancy. Like he was seen as a very, you know, God-fearing religious person. He just made two terrible decisions. But his personal vendetta for David, that's a private matter. Right, look, I joined late, so maybe I'm just seeing the, seeing this whole thing with David, okay, and it's like, um, but, like, I feel like it's not, like, that's what, that was the focus, that's been the focus for the last, I don't know how many chapters, and it's not like, oh, we have something that tells us that, you know, he built a, he built a tunnel, and he built uh, this road, and, you know, he invested in schools, and, okay, I mean, we don't have a record, you can only go on what you have. Okay, and mm -hmm. it's this it's this obsession with it that has brought him to this point. Okay, right, and I think I think you're right in that perspective. And there's certainly many lessons that we learn, uh, certainly about uh, you know self destruction, how we can really uh, you know hurt ourselves by uh, you know by really not being able to understand when are you going to leave something and when are you going to have such a vendetta which. Uh, you know, you think that you're trying to uh, do something productive, whereas in fact it's actually going to end up uh, destroying your soul. I mean, 100%. Let's have a look at these psukim. And again, I really do encourage you, uh, if not if it's tonight or it's on Shabbat, to really celebrate the fact that we've finished all of Shmuel, Shmuel Aleph and to have a celebratory if it's a Lachaim. If it's a, a nice piece of, uh, if it's a nice meal, just uh, enjoy this. Try to think about it, because this is, uh, I really think, a major accomplishment. Uh, to Rob's point, we're now going to get some of the description of uh, the death of Shaul. I mean, not the death of Shaul, how they mutilated his body. It says here in Pasuk Zion, Vayiru anshe Yisrael asher ve'eve ha'emek, v'asher ve'eve ha'yarden, ki nasu anshe Yisrael, and the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and who were on the other side of the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Shaul and his three sons had died and they left the cities and fled and the Palestim came and occupied them. And it was on the morrow that the Pilishtim came to strip the slain, and they found Shaul and his sons lying on Mount Gilboa. And they severed his head and stripped his armor, and they set them around in the land of the Pilishtim, to spread the tidings to the house of their idols and to the people. Yud, by Esimu Ekelav, Beit Ashtarot Bet Giviato, Taku Bechomat Bechan. And they put his armor in the house of Ashtarot and they impaled his body on the walls of Bechan. And the commentaries discuss this, which is why did this horrible, horrible uh, mutilation of his body have to take place by the Palestinian? Why was it allowed? And uh, the commentaries say that this was, a, um, as much as his death was a kapara for what he did wrong in life, so was the mutilation of his body. That was an extension of his death. And through that, he was allowed to have full atonement so that he could go to Gan Eden. Again, that's what the commentaries say. I know it's hard read. That's what I'm going to leave that with. 
And in the last three psukim, we hear of the der daring raid of the men of Yavesh Gilad. And the inhabitants of Yavesh Gilad heard about him, that which the Philistim had done to Shaul. And all the brave men rose and went all night and took Shaul's body and his son's bodies from the wall of bet -shan, and they came to Yavesh and burned them there. And they took their bones and buried them under the tree in Yavesh, and they fasted seven days. And it's not clear what's going on here. What are the men, the men of, the, of Yavesh Gilad getting involved in? It says in the Ma'am Loez to remind us, the inhabitants of Yavesh Gilad never forgot what Shaul had done for them when he rescued them from Nachash of Ammon. They risk everything to bury Shaul and his sons. And why do they risk everything? Because he risked everything. He was not, he was just appointed king, anointed king, but the people didn't believe in him. And it was this moment of him rescuing uh, uh, Yavesh Gilad from, uh, from Nachash that really made him uh, king in the eyes of the people. And so the men of Yavesh Gilad wanted to show Hakar Tatov by, uh, by helping him. Now what's interesting here is they burned them there. What did they burn? Says Rashi, they burned Shaul's possessions since no one may use the personal belongings of the king. But the Radak says, no, they burnt them, meaning the bodies were beginning to decompose and were infested from exposure so the people burned the flesh, leaving the bones for burial. Normally, we're not allowed to do this. We have to bury the bodies in uh, uh, what's known as a, Jew a Jewish burial. But here, since they've been mutilated, since they've been left out, they had to be burned first. And the Radak says, we learn this from the fact that it says that they're bones were buried, as opposed to saying that their, uh, their bodies were buried. So I'll be precise there that uh, it says at the end there, in, in, the, in Yud Gimel, and they took their bones and buried them because they, uh, the flesh was all burnt up. Now it says there that they fasted seven days. Why did they fast seven days? And again, the Ma'am Loez says there that it was seven days was uh, how long, uh, again, going back to that, it, it corresponded to the story back then with uh, the men of, uh, with, with Nachash and saving them for, and uh, they got, getting saved from Nachash. He gave them seven days to prepare themselves. So they fasted seven days to acknowledge that uh, Shaul had saved them from that fate. So again, I really want to applaud all of you. Uh, you. Most of you are here week in, week out. Uh, and if you're not in week in, week out, you're listening to the classes afterwards, you're going through the sources on your own. It's, uh, it gives me incredible chizuk, gives me strength to learn with you and to have you dedicated ones always doing so. So please, I, I honestly mean it. Have a lachaim, have a nice meal if it's tonight. Uh, in, in honor of Rosh Chodesh, or it's on Shabbat, enjoy the fact that we have finished Shmuel Aleph, and please God, we'll begin Shmuel Bet next week. Have a wonderful, wonderful uh, Rosh Chodesh, and Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Chodesh Tov.